Hello everyone and welcome to our core set deck building guide where we are going to walk you through the basics of deck building in Netrunner and specifically use the revised core set uh, to show you basically what you might consider doing as you bust into these decks and start playing the game. It's a new dawn. It is a new dawn and one of the most overwhelming things about a living card game, card game of any kind that is kind of one of these more expansive experiences is that you do have to make decks. So whereas in a game of poker, we all know the cards in the deck, uh, in a game like this, we have to actually desi decide what cards we're going to include in our decks. It is simultaneously one of the best and That's right. most intensive parts of the game. It's, and I say this without really any, uh, you know, exaggeration, it's, it's a bit of an art form. I mean, it's really, it's expressive of who you are as a player, what you're trying to accomplish, how you approach a problem, uh, and basically kind of what interests you, like the theme that interests you. So don't be scared. It's actually uh, quite easy once you get the hang of it. And it's really the one thing that can, can keep you coming back to a game like Netrunner for the next five years, uh, for those of us who have been doing it for the past five years. That's right, <laughs> five years in, here we go. Um, so we have laid out here all of the various corporations and runners found in the revised core set, as well as the neutral corp cards and the neutral runner cards. What you'll see here is there are four different corporations, and that is static so far in the game. Uh, you have the purple corporation, HB, Haas Bioroids. They're all about bioroids, and uh, it, there's a lot to that. You should look at <laughs> the Android world with bioroids and it's that kind world. of stuff. Uh, but, but basically think um, very intelligent AI robots that are maybe also having rights and human qualities and that kind of thing. It's the whole artificial intelligence. At some point, do they may, you know, get consciousness? And at what point do they gain rights? But Absolutely. the short version is they are the ones creating those and pushing that envelope. Meantime, in comparison, I'll move them up here, you have mm -hmm. Jinteki, and they're, all, they're known for cloning. So they do a lot of clones. So you have this, this beautiful kind of um, pressure going on between Hasbiroid and Jinteki, one of them promoting clones as the kind of way of the fusion, one of them promoting bioroids as the both successful sticky answer. Both issues of their own. Yeah, and both very, very confusing. Uh, and so Jinteki functions in a lot of, they like to do traps, they do a lot of very tricky things. So they're a tricky faction. HB is like, they play out kind of robotically in the sense that they're all about efficiency and you know just like getting it done in a short amount of time, those kinds of things. I, I think a good way to compare those two in particular is one is very organic, mm -hmm. which is Genteki, which is more flexible, more tricky, yeah. more they have that like, you know, just uh, adaptable really. They're adaptable versus the bioids, which are very programmed. Yeah. Right? It's like if, if you break it down, you get really into like everything behind computers and technology, uh, the reality of it still being ones and zeros and someone yeah. programming it, and it's like, it's, it's programmed. That's true, yeah, it makes, and that makes a lot of sense given their, their themes. Uh, and then we have the third, which is NBN. This is the giant megacorp news organization, They're basically right? just covering the other companies. So we, we <laughs> all know how powerful, uh, you know, corporate news can be, and in Android, it's pushed even beyond that. So controlling the narrative, really controlling the way that people understand and view things. So NBN is a lot about actually tagging and information. So they're trying to find out where the runner is, they're punishing the runner for that information. They're very good at just basically information, capital I information. They have the all-seeing eye, they see everything, they know what's going on, and they can find you if they're looking for you. So <laughs> NBN can be a very Watch terrifying out. corporation. We have a lot about traces and tags. And then we have finally Wayland. Wayland Consortium. Wayland's kind of just the good old giant corporation looking to make a buck, right? I, I, I look at Wayland as like the good old boy company, yeah. like the oil company or the, and they're really, they are in the universe are known for the beanstalk. Yeah. Which so is. That was the elevator, right? Between yeah. Earth and the moon. Just some big technological advances, even their tagline here is building a better world. And so they don't build clones, they don't build artificial, you know, intelligent sense. They're making the robots. Cash. They're a business. Yeah. <laughs> they are straight business, so they're all about money. They're all about money, and as it so happens, they're all about moral ambiguity because they are also the most What's likely that? to just blow up your house. 
right? So a whoa, lot of whoa, Wayland whoa. cards <laughs> do what's called meat damage, which is literally just like sending a hit squad to attack the runner uh, or blow it, literally blowing them up. And, so. you know, there have been a lot of ties drawn to the Wayland Corporation and deaths of certain <laughs> runners. Zach plays uh, a lot of Wayland, so of course I'm he's just the Wayland uh, Yeah, they, they, they pay for hits. That's kind of one of the things they can do. So those are the four corporations, and then we also have three runners. There are additional runners, uh, runner factions, little mini factions that are available in a deluxe expansion. But for now, we're going to focus on the revised core set runners. These are the main factions in the game. You have the criminals, uh, and they are, you know, they're the, the white collar uh, kind of runners, right? So they might, <laughs> they might have associations with some of the top brass at some of these corporations. They might go to cocktail hours. They also have a lot of really good connections on the street. So they do, as you said, organic. There are a lot of very organic decisions in a criminal deck, and they also revolve a lot around money. They love robbing and getting the cash and doing that kind the of criminals. stuff, right? Uh, so they're criminals. They're the, they're the classic uh, white collar criminals there. Then we have uh, the Anarchs. And as you might expect, the Anarchs revolve primarily around chaos, destruction, disruption. They don't have any grand motivation a lot of the times uh, for doing what they do, aside from uh, just this kind of sense of liberation and freedom and don't tread on me kind of stuff. Like, like it's like for the free internet movement, like all that kind of stuff, cryptocurrencies, all of this. I think of a really good lack example. Of control. If you've seen Mr. Robot, there it is. That kind of group where it's like we kind of just want to reset the system. We yeah. want to burn it all down. And and just kind of because I mean every every runner has their own reasons for doing it. That's one of the cool things about the game. There's a lot of lore behind that. But the Anarch faction as a whole is going to have a lot of very disruptive and chaotic techniques that they're going to use. They also spend a lot of time using viruses. So that's another one of their big uh, themes. And then finally, you have the shapers. So the shapers are the creative. Um, I would say technologically based faction, right? So it's they have tech, they have a lot of programs there. Of these, right, it's like the criminals pay, usually have to pay to yeah. have this technology and to be able to hack. They're probably not as good at hacking. They're better at really the human element of this exactly, whole game. Exactly, versus the shapers, which are very technologically based. Yeah. So they have programs swapping around, and they're searching for programs, and they're trashing programs to install other programs. They're a lot of times seen as trying to build kind of this beautiful... Uh, rig, this beautiful uh, computer that they can do anything that they want with, right? So they're pursuing perfection. And in a sense, a lot of them kind of treat that as kind of a beauty art kind of thing. Like, this is my dance. This is how I express myself on, on the net. Um, so the shapers are very much into those kinds of concepts. And they usually end up with very good programs, very efficient programs. And at the end of the game, shapers can generally get anywhere that they want in a server because they, they have just have it all built, built up yeah, and, and done. And then you have your neutral stuff. So those are the factions, and you'll pretty quickly kind of figure out where you like to play. Um, most of these corporations have a theme that will gel with somebody, and even within each corporation, there are multiple identities in various expansions that you can get that will further define kind of the way that you want to play Netrunner. So like Gabriel is a criminal runner, and there are other criminal runners that, while they all might revolve around similar concepts and strengths, they do very different things. That is correct. Uh, so let's tell, let's take a uh, Waylon. Let's start I was there. Say, you want to just build? Instance, are we going to build just, some decks Let's here? just take Waylon. I'll let you slide those. The away. first thing that we're going to look at is the bottom left of the card. So okay. that's going to tell us the minimum deck size in the top. So 45 card deck is the minimum for Wayland. And then 15 is the influence that I can bring into this deck. And we'll cover that at the very end of this video. Um, so every corporation has a special set of rules for deck building. They have to have a bracket of, of agenda points for the bracket of cards in their deck. So for instance, Wayland, with a minimum of 45, can have 45 to 49 cards in the deck. If a corporation, I don't think we have one in the core set, has a 40 card minimum, it can have 40 to 44 cards in the deck as its primary bracket. Now, any corporation can have any amount of cards over their minimum. But for reasons that we won't exactly dive into now, <laughs> it's generally best to stick to the top end of whatever bracket you're in. So Wayland is 45 to 49, and you can find this all in the rule book, which means they have 20 to 21 points in their deck. So, so you we're going to build a 49 card deck with 20 or 21 points. And this is pretty easy to understand that if I have a 45 card deck with 21 agenda points in it versus a 49 card deck with 21 agenda points in it, there's this concept called agenda density. And it simply means that I'm more likely to see agendas 
because I have more or less cards per agenda point in my deck. So I generally want the most amount of non-agenda cards that I can fit in there. Yes. So let's kick it off. Now, every one of these core set decks starts with, I believe it's like 27 cards that, that come standard. So if we're building a basic deck out of the core set, we're gonna take these cards, these are all of my Wayland cards. We're going to add all of these neutral cards. And you're gonna notice that if we total these agendas up, we're gonna have 20 to 21 points. And we're also going to have 48 cards, I believe is where it lands. So right there, make sure to count that it's for me. 21 make sure points. That's, correct. that's 21 points, all right. all right. So this is actually pretty simple to build out of the It is, set. that's, that's uh, the adequate amount of points. And then we have this amount of cards, I believe is 48. Can you count those for me? Yeah, Check I'm your on, shoe. I want it. Uh, David Blanger, for anybody not, uh, not apprised of that. Can you get that? Did you get that? Uh, and so we're gonna smash this all together and then we're going to look at what's left and then we're going to explore the influence mechanic to fill in the gaps for what we might wanna bring into the deck. So Zach's counting. 48. That's 48 cards. As you would have it, magic Which means trick achieved. We can have one card. Um, so yeah. let's go ahead and- One whole card. Can, can you bust those out and I'm gonna start looking yeah. over here. Yeah. So basically we have this influence mechanic where we can import 15 influence worth of cards from any other faction and any number of other factions as long as it adds up to 15 or less. So if you look at a standard corporation card, you will find in the bottom left corner, there is a matrix of dots that goes all the way up to five. That number of dots determines how much influence it costs to bring that card into your deck. So for instance, let's look at Ghost Branch. Ghost Branch comes from NBN. It has one influence because there is one dot filled. And so I can have one Ghost Branch in my deck and that will use up one of my 15 influence. Then we look at a card like, let's see, let's see if we can find a big one, like Flare, right? Big piece of ice from NBN. If I put a Flare in my Wayland deck, it costs me three influence. So I can do three out of my 15 influence on Flare. Now I could include up to three Flares and have nine influence used. I can include two flares and a ghost branch. I can include all sorts of things. So I get to pull from any other corporation, any number of cards, as long as I do not have more than 15 influence in my deck. And now it is worth noting at this point that you can only have three of any individual card in your deck. So keep that in mind as you are deck building. So let's, Zach, let's approach this as we would as deck builders. Okay. So right now I'm looking, I've got 48 cards. That means I have a slot for one extra card and I also wanna focus on some central concepts for a corporation deck. One is ice. I want to make sure that I have a decent spread of sentry, code gate, and barrier ice so that I can always keep the runner on their toes and force them to break through various types of ice. If you include only barriers in your deck, hmm. the runner only has to install a single breaker that breaks barriers to take care of all of your ice. And that cannot be a very productive way to run a defensive corporation. Now, with any of these rules, there's gonna be massive exceptions when you get into the advanced like game of Netrunner. But when you're building your first deck. First deck, this is really important to keep in mind. So let's look at what we're doing here. We've got, uh, how many, what are we looking on sentries? We've got sentries, sentries, sentry, sentry. There's our barriers and there's our code gates, right? Okay. So, so our sp spread is pretty okay there. Seven sentries. But you'll notice something. We only have three code gates. We only have three code gates. Now, when you're starting out, it's good to kind of I always aim for around 15 to 18 pieces of ice. Now, by modern standards, that's probably a little bit heavy, but for, a, for an opening deck, you would never wanna be left without ice because that can be really scary. Um, so let's see, what do we have here? Let's go look for some code gates. Let's look at NBN. So we're at 18 currently. We're at 18. Let's, let's just toss a few in and we can always cut stuff too. Uh, ooh, there's a pop-up window. Oh, the, here we go, classic splash. Let's go there. Ah, the old toll booth. So let's start with uh, importing a couple of pieces of ice from NBN. I've noticed that there's a lack of code gates in my spread here. I've also noticed that when I'm looking at this big uh, section of ice, I only have one big piece. It's a 10 cost piece of ice, Hadrian's Wall. we're apparently Vault. a corporation good at money. And we're pretty good at money. So let's go ahead and throw a toll booth in there. This says that when the runner encounters toll booth, they have to spend three credits. And if they can't, then they can't get through. Then they have to spend a lot of cash just to break through it. It's a classic piece of ice, very good import for your first deck. So toll booth, there's four of our 15 influence that we have spent. Okay. Um, so I like, I like that. We can sit on that ice for now. Something else to keep in mind, let's look at our ID ability. What do we have there? 
gain one credit whenever you play a transaction operation. So we really? currently have three beanstalks and three hedge hmm. funds. Now, can your influence come from a multitude of corporations? M multitude of corporations Oof. from any and everywhere. This is the internet. It's the it's the web. It's you the can net. get it, stuff from anywhere. Anything is anywhere. So I feel like we're going to be adding some operations here. Why don't we do that? Why don't we go ahead and just uh, start with three green level clearance there? Okay. So now we are spending three more influence. Those are transaction operations, right? Seven influence. All right, four, five, six, seven. All right. We're going to so get to the card cut in a little bit. But how many ammo influence do we have? Fifteen. We have eight left to spend. Man. All right, so the other thing to look at is I like to have at least nine to 12 money cards. All right, right? we currently have nine. We've got a bunch of money cards, right? Well, actually, we have more. If you count uh, Melange and Pet Campaign. Yeah, so, so we're have, off to a good start, we right? So we've got cards, plenty yeah. of money. We'll start cutting later. And so now let's look at some other things that we might want to throw in here. So we have eight influence to spend. Um, I can't import any agendas from another faction because they don't have an influence cost. So what are we lacking? Why don't we why don't we make a couple of fun moves? Kind of yes, the next yes, thing that, next thing that I start to look at is can we import some tricks? Can we can we bring in some unexpected cards from another faction that's really just going to confuse the runner? I think snare is a great choice. It's a very common trap. Whenever your opponent hits it, you can actually spend money and do net damage and give them attack, which will trigger stuff like your dedicated response team, which is never a bad thing. And then I'm going to throw in another option here. Let's go ahead and cut a snare trick of and throw in a trick of light, all right? All right. So this is just basically looking at what are some basic tricks that we can use to make this deck better. So a couple of Wayland themes that we notice if we look at this entire card pool. One, they gain money when you play transaction operations. So immediately, let's find the transaction operations. Which we Found do. one, green level clearance, just throw it in. Secondarily, you'll notice that they have cards like Ice Wall and Shadow that have very special text that says you can advance the ice. And this is a very special Wayland concept. So if we're already advancing ice, we might then look at a card like Trick of Light from Jinteki, which says I can move up to two advancement tokens from a card to another installed card that can be advanced. So I can move maybe some advancements from a shadow to an ice wall. More specifically, I can move advancement tokens from a shadow or an ice wall to an agenda. So I can spend one action to essentially advance something twice if I have those advancement tokens on the board. That's very important for being able to score out of hand and other tricks. So I've got that, and then we're just kind of looking at, well, what kind of gaps do we need to fill in? So let's fill in a code gate gap here with a toll booth. That's a great, great choice. And then let's have a single snare that might just totally wreck the runner out of Surprise nowhere. snares are the best. Snare is just a, it's this card where the runner accesses it, it does a bunch of damage, and uh, it's just really devastating. Also lands a tag, which can be very important. All right, so here we have our tricks and whatnot. Okay, so we've added eight cards. We've added eight to cards. To our 48, and now we're at 56. So let's make some cuts, shall we? Well, we need to cut seven cards. Seven cards. All right, so dedicated response team. If the runner is tagged, I can do two meat damage when there's a successful run. That plays kind of well with our like one-off snare, which is pretty hilarious, so I kind of like having that in. Um, we have Elizabeth Mills. When you play it, you can remove a bad publicity, trash a location, take a bad publicity. That's fine. Let's leave Elizabeth in there. Uh, Grindel can be advanced, and it gains a bunch of money for every event. That you gotta so love good. Grindel. What I'm feeling is that we between, have so much money between the operations and Grindel Refinery. I think we can just totally cut Melange and Pad Campaign. I right? agree. Let's get rid of those so five cards right off. Five the top. cards. Now we're down to fifty-one. Two cards left. Got into you. All right, so let's cut two here. We've got a shipment. I kind of like the Figuia. shipment. It works with our Trick of Light play and our Advanceable Ice. I like that as well. I, I feel like we have we have a good number of barriers. So let's just consider cutting like one wall of static. I think Ice Wall does that job pretty well. All right, so we need one more card. One more cut. Why don't we do? I think I would either look at one Grindel Refinery or cutting something like uh, Elizabeth Mills. I think we'll cut Elizabeth Mills. Let's cut Elizabeth out of it. Now, she's a really good tech card. Like, you'll find that the ability to trash locations is actually really important. Could be very important. But for your first deck, it's gonna you're going to probably struggle to find the right way to use her and the bad publicity mechanic. You're going to have to get your head around. So there we have it. We've included two toll booths, a snare, two trick of light, and three green level clearance. And that comprises our 15 influence which is the maximum given on our Wayland Consortium card there. And then the rest of the deck equals 49 cards, 
We've got our 21 points. 20 to 21 is necessary for 45 to 49 cards. And there you have it. And we I built ourselves a Wayland deck. I would say when you first get into the game, if you know you can put your cards out and like we said it got you to 48 without yep. doing anything and i think you can play with that deck straight out and learn the game enjoy game gain some perspective and learn a lot uh even just adding the influence is fun if you think you're ready for that and if you're not we'll actually be providing deck lists for all of the revised core set uh, absolutely and i want to say the following too just as a general kind of rule of thumb corporation deck building can be hard First thing is the reason that you have these brackets is that there has to be a guaranteed distribution of points throughout a corporation deck, right? So it looks a little confusing at first, but as your deck grows, the basically the ratio of agenda points in your deck needs to grow with it as well. So that's why that mechanic exists, keeps it fair and tidy for everybody involved. And then for just a general checklist for your first deck, just keep it simple. Go 18 to 20 pieces of ice, yep. go nine to 12, things that are gaining you money, economy cards, and then make sure you have the agendas that equal 20 to 21 points. After that, the world is yours. Look at what your cards do, look at some tricks, look at your influence, and, and also, just play around. I like the advice of evening out your ice types. Yes. I think that's important too. 18 to 20, but then also if you can have five to six of each. Absolutely. Or five to seven, then it'll balance out and you'll find yourself not in like a sticky situation. For sure. So let's do the same for runners. Yeah, I was going to say, there's some some primary differences between the runner and the court. So I'll clean this up while you're uh, We're gonna, making gonna choices. Let's, let's go with, um, I mean, it's hard for me not to do Anarch. Let's go with Shaper. That'll challenge challenge my thinking. Challenge on, on really, camera. That's a bold. Really, really prove it. So I'm going to grab all of the Shaper cards out of the core set, and I'm also going to grab all of the neutral cards. And I think that's around 47 to 48 cards as well. So the runner deck is much easier to build. So you have the same kind of thing in the bottom right hand corner of the identity card that you're using. In Chaos Theory's case, we have a minimum deck size of 40 and we have 15 influence that can be used. So for the runner, there's no brackets you have to worry about. There's no 40 to 45. There's no agendas that. that have to go in the deck? Nope, this is very simply, you can have a minimum deck size of 40. The average for a runner ID is 45. So Chaos Theory revolves around consistency. Because I have less cards in my deck, I'm gonna see those cards more often. So I can very easily get my programs up and running and get the combos that I want together. And it's very important to have a smaller deck size with Chaos Theory. Also has plus one MU right out of the box. So it can run a bigger set of programs and has a smaller deck. So this, this runner is all about efficiency. Taking out really and nice. just leaning into it. All right, so we've got these runner cards. Let's uh, spread those guys out. And then I feel like you're like the, uh, we're doing like a cooking show. And, <laughs> and I'm the, the, what would you call that? The assistant? Yeah. You're just the assistant. You're just out oh, over there man. saying, oh, I'm, as, this is just amazing. As we laid out the IDs, I was looking and early on I played Wayland and Shaper. And I was thinking to myself as we were looking, I'm curious why I chose Shaper. And then as I have now seen these cards, that's I'm, why I'm reminded uh, why I chose Shaper. Even just test trying to make your eye making me very happy and excited. All right, so we're gonna put all of our uh, icebreaker programs up here yep. and general programs. Yeah, Magnum sure. Opus, really killer for the Shapers there. And I think in every one of these uh, corset decks, we've got ways to break every piece of ice. So remember. You have barriers, code gates, and sentries to worry about in the game. And so you wanna make sure that you have ways to break each. So for the runner, I always start with my rig, right? So the, the programs you're gonna to use to break the ice. The most important thing in this game is icebreakers and money. If you can't get into servers, you're never gonna win. And if you don't have the money to get into servers, you're obviously never going to win. So forget about all the tricks and the fancy stuff and the beautiful things. First, we gotta go back to basics, right? So I'm suggesting that you include three of every type of breaker, or every type of ice. So I've got three battering rams and shaper, that breaks barriers. I've got three pipelines, that breaks sentries. And I've got three of the beautiful Gordian blade. Classic. Which breaks code gates, right? So I'm covered. I can, I can break all different kinds of ice. Let's just hold it there. Nine cards, three of, of each and let's make sure that we can break ice at all times. Okay, so now we move to money. Let's move to money, shall we? Yeah. So I like to do, again, at least nine to 12 in a runner deck would be very solid money cards. Shapers are a little bit interesting in that they have a more permanent source of funding in the Magnum Opus. So this is a 
prototypical, or I should say typical, uh, Shaper card in that it is a program that is extremely efficient at doing exactly what you need it to do. And in this case, it sits on the board and gives you click for two money instead incredible. of click for one. And that, if you get that on the board, I mean, that is pretty much as good as most economy options that you're gonna find. So let's just go ahead and throw Magnum Opus in there. And then let's include three sure gambles. That's always a good choice. Even to this day, I think I've been putting <laughs> three sure gambles and everything. And three Armitage code busting, a good option for until you find your Magnum Opus, uh, you, you can still make some money and threaten the corporation. So that's all of our money cards. Is that that seems about right? Yeah. Technically, we have infiltration. I want to get your opinion on the old infiltration. Technically, let's throw it in here. Let's throw infiltration. And this is a great card out of the core set. A really good beginner card when you're learning the game. It has two options. You can either gain two money with it, or you can expose a card. And exposing a card basically flips it over and shows it to you. So if you're worried about a piece of ice, if you're worried about something in a remote server, you can go ahead and expose it before you actually commit to running it. All right. So we also have, not to be forgotten, a neutral option, which is Underworld Contact. It's a special kind of rolling money card that says when your turn begins, gain a credit if you have at least two link. Now you'll notice Chaos Theory starts with zero link, and the only way to get link from these neutral, this neutral card pool is both Dyson Mimchip and then in the Shapers, Rabbit Hole. So, Shapers are actually pretty good, probably the best in the game at getting link straight. This is basically building up a digital wall around them Which so that sense. they're hard to they're trace. Tech, tech background. Now, if I look at Rabbit Hole, it says that when it's installed, I can search my deck and get another copy of Rabbit Hole and install it. And if I do that, that's going to give me two link. That's going to be enough to trigger my underworld contacts. So, Zach, I like, I'm just going to keep all of this in. I'm just going to add, and we can subtract if we need to later. I'm just going to keep all of that in. So there's all of our money. So we've got all of our programs and all of our money options. And now... Now, technically, I don't know, where, where do you land on modded as far as economy? Is that an economy card? Well, it is an economy card, but we're gonna kind of treat it in the, in the speed space or the, right. the money space, but it is an economy card. So now, what I wanna check on next is, given the rig that I have here, if I have all of these programs out, what does my MU situation look like? What kind of memory am I working with? So you'll see in the corner here, I've got two for a battering ram, I've got one for pipeline, one for Gordian blade, and I've got two for magnum opus. So this could be a problem. I have six MU showing if I get my full rig out, and I have five because chaos theory starts with an extra. So I wanna start to look for ways to remedy that. So I have the classic Dyson <laughs> memory chip, simply gives me some extra memory so I can install more programs. I'm going to hold off on that for now because let's go ahead and investigate the rest of the card pool and see what might solve that problem. Yeah, I think I wanna point out Dinosaurus here. Always look at your console. That's kind of the next place to go. And you'll, you'll notice as you start building these decks, as you learn new elements of deck building and kind of add new things, you'll go back to decisions you had previously made and kind of change them. Sure. And that's exactly how deck building is supposed to work. So let's look at Dinosaurus. It hosts a single icebreaker, and that's awesome. And it says the memory cost of the icebreaker doesn't count against your memory limit. So now we're looking at a battering ram on Dinosaurus. Doesn't cost us memory anymore. Sure. So ideally, the chaos theory kind of rig at the end of this has one of these programs on Dinosaurus not counting its memory. So that puts us back in AOK -okay zone. Which is exactly what you want. So, so let, you let's know, just assume that that's correct. Yeah. Okay, so what do you look at next? We've got console, we've got programs, we've got money. Now it's all the fun stuff, really. Let's so, just let's just <laughs> start to start to look at what's really gonna do work for us. First, we have Maker's Eye and indexing. This is multi-access, right? Great cards for multi-access. Multi-access is a fundamental of your runner deck. You generally want to have a way to threaten multiple cards in a single access, whether it's on HQ, R and D, or both. Those are gonna be critical. So you'll find those in pretty much all of these opening card pools. If you don't have them in a deck, consider like grabbing them from other factions and bringing them in. Ways to access multiple cards at a time. Very important to the game. Okay, I also very much like Test Run. Test Run, This is where Excellent. you search through your deck and actually get one of these cards that you need. That's right, great card, allows you to search through, grab something that you need, and you'll learn as you go like what cards you might wanna include or take out of your Shaper deck. But for the beginning, you know what? Let's just throw them all in, Zach, and see what we're left with. All the cards? Yeah, let's throw them all in. All right, here we go. Boom. Diesel, notoriety. And then go ahead and 
Let's count those up and see where we are. And then we're gonna look at interesting cards that we might wanna import from another faction. So naturally my hand is drawn to Anarch. I tend to absolutely love the faction. So we're at 42 before we influence anything. Okay, 42 cards is what we start with, yeah? Yep. And we have a 40 card minimum deck list. So before we start making cuts, let's see what we might wanna bring into the game. With our 15 influence. So I feel like we have a, a rig nice. I, if we could get a, uh, what does he break? A barrier breaker that doesn't cost two memory, I think that would be good. That would be. Because then you wouldn't need the extra memory. A reasonable choice, so we could always go there. We also have a number of options that we could bring in to make our uh, programs cheaper to operate. So you'll notice that we have like a one strength on this pipeline for sentries, which is not great at all. Uh, we also have two strength on the Gordian, costs one to buff it up, so it's, it's pretty efficient. One thing when you're looking at icebreakers is you kind of ask the question, Really, if I'm breaking a piece of ice, how much is this gonna cost? Sure. So for instance, if I look at uh, Gordian Blade, it starts at two strength, costs one to get plus one, costs one to break a subroutine. Like, that's really good. If I look over here at Pipeline, it starts at one strength, costs two to get plus one strength, but it remains for the rest of the run, and it's one to break a sentry subroutine. So it's double the cost to pump the strength, but it lasts all run. Yeah. Now, if your opponent stacks up two to three sentries, that can be really good. Otherwise, it's just costing you a lot of money to use. Uh, and over here on Battering Ram, we have a similar situation. We started a higher strength of three, plus one for the remainder of the run for one credit. That's really good. That's strong. But it costs two to break up to two barrier subroutines. So a barrier with three subroutines, it costs four to break. Sure. So it has some inefficiencies built in there too. So we might wanna look at maybe replacing pipeline. Like what other options do we have? From the criminals, we have sentry breakers in the form of fairies, and those are disposable, kind of single use. We also have the always worth looking at Femme Fatale, right? <laughs> One influence, just classic. One influence, and what it does is if you install it, you choose a piece of ice, and you can just spend one and bypass that piece of ice for the rest of the game. So this is a great get out of jail free card. So es I might just Especially show with a card one like Testron, mm -hmm. that lets you search your deck and put it into play for a turn. That would let you put Fem's token on something, and then at the end of the turn, Test Run returns it to the top of your deck. That means you get to draw it and potentially play it again. Boom. So something else we might import from Criminal is like a Mr. Lee option. So we're trying to be very efficient and get our cards very quickly. Mr. Lee is gonna help us do that. We also might look at additional multi-access, right? Mm, so the Shapers are traditionally, you see their three cards here, Maker's Eye and Indexing are all about attacking R&D. So maybe, the best option is for us to have some like secret HQ attacks. Sure. So let's start exploring that option. So let's let's drop in an HQ interface. I'm also going to look at uh, a couple of tricks like emergency shutdown. It's a great little trick. So you know if you look at the shaper card pool, you're saying oh shapers are going to be all about R and D. Well, you know what? I'm not going to do that at all. I I'm going to go right for HQ. Here. Some other options that I'm and looking at. And so basically, at. really at this point in deck building, right? You laid out your options for your mm -hmm. faction, and then we have 15 influence, so we're gonna put potential cards we're gonna play out, and then cut back. But at this point, you're looking through, and you're asking questions like, what cards go with my the rest of my deck? What synergizes with what I'm already doing? What maybe offers some strengths that I don't have? And what can cover up some of the weaknesses that I might have? If a faction doesn't have a good code gate breaker, splashing into a faction that does is obviously very useful. So. Absolutely once you, correct. Once you have those 50, 55 cards out that you want, then you cut back down. And really, that lets you just get a deck going, get to the table, and make adjustments after every game. Absolutely. And I want to, for me, I think the best thing to do like out of a core set is really try to, to do unexpected things, you know? Sure. So like some, some other unexpected tricks are a lot of them are in this early criminal card pool, right? We've got inside job. We've got Forge Activation we Orders. Beta somewhere. We have Bank Jobs. We do have Sneak Door Beta, but when I'm looking at it, like, do you think, do we really want to have two more memory hogging up our space? Oh, I forgot it costs memory. Yikes. Could be a problem, but you could also make that deck, right? So let's, let's move on with this kind of expanding our threat range. So let's add an HQ threat with HQ interface. Let's add another HQ threat with Emergency Shutdown. So it says when I make a success run on HQ, I can derez a piece of ice. Could be big. So nobody thinks that's coming. So what are we at there? Is that four, six, six, six influence? Six influence, yeah. Now, 
I'm just partial to the card, so I'm gonna advocate for Ice Carver. All right, we'll do it. This is simply all ice is encountered with its strength lowered by one. So if I'm a shaper and I'm thinking, I wanna be as efficient as possible, having all of my ice at minus one means that I can break it so much easier sure. with these cards. I'm all right with so that. So that's three. So we're at nine total influence, we have six left. Let's throw right here, two inside jobs. All right, that's a great and classic card. That's a three influence card, and that puts us up to our 15 influence. And so now I've imported some tricks that's kind of rounded out my deck. So when I looked, I needed a little bit more of a threat to HQ. I didn't have any HQ threats showing, so I imported some of those from Criminal. I imported something that went with my deck idea, which is just very efficient runs and being able to do things very well. And then finally, I went with a just out of nowhere, straight up out of the blue trick with inside And job. we actually, you have Mr. Lee here. Yeah, let's cut him. So I was gonna say, we we're, we're over now. Cut Mr. Lee. All right, so we were at 42 cards and we just added six. So now we're at 48. Now we're looking to cut eight cards. We need to cut eight cards, all right. So I'm gonna cut, start with very, I like, okay, so I like these together. I think Rabbit Hole and Underworld go together because he, neither of them is yeah. beneficial without so the other. So you're either, Having the four or cutting the four. That's correct. So we'll see what else we have. And other things that are looking like uh, worth cutting are potentially something like an Aesop's Pawn Shop. Deck's not really built to take advantage of that. I think that's a strong tech piece in a certain kind of deck. It's a great card, potentially Zach's favorite card, if you've ever watched uh, years and years of our unboxing videos. <laughs> I forgot about that. That um, is so great. Let's go ahead and cut that. We don't need that. See Aesop. Uh, Tinkering, an incredible card. One of my absolute favorites. But I'm wondering if with a 40 card Chaos Theory deck and the, the quickness with which I'm gonna be able to get these programs out, how useful that's ultimately gonna to be to me. I, I agree with you. I love this card, I love this art as well, but I'm, I'm, I say we pass on all it. All right, let's, let's pass on it. All right, let's we got get three out of, of the eight that we need to get rid of. We've got All Nighter. I think that that's a great card. Cost me a click, and, or it cost me a click to play it, and then I spend a click and trash it to gain two clicks. So this is a nice, I mean, this is never gonna be bad, right? It's, it's a stored click, right? We'll, we'll keep it on the, on the table for now. I'm, I'm a fan of removal of personal touch. Yeah, personal touch, you can install it onto an icebreaker and give it plus strength. We already have Dinosaurus giving a breaker plus strength. We already have Ice Carver lowering the strength. We just might not need it. So let's yeah. let's cut that for now. All right, we're at four, we're halfway home. Uh, sacrificial Construct, prevent an installed program or piece of harbor from being trashed. We don't need this, we're safe. I mean, we're good runners. We don't need these kind of That's like parachutes, right? One of the advantages of Shaper is that you can be in a position where you you know you've got your, your bases covered. Yeah. And particularly if you have the century base covered, it can only go so bad for your programs. All right, how many did we cut? We need Five, we need three more. Three more, and okay. I, I'm actually looking at the icebreakers now. Do we need three rams? Do you need it? No. But do you want to have it? Uh -oh. Probably. I'm going to say this. Here's, here's, my, here's my logic. I'm going to say modded is giving us essentially three money for installing with, which is nice. So modded lowers the cost of something by three. So let's just cut these Armitage. So Armitage functions the exact same way as Magnum Opus. So once I see this and install it, this is a worthless card to I me. I totally agree with let's you. Let's cut it. And there we have it, right? Eight so we've, cards. We've got a deck now. Obviously, as you play through, what you're gonna notice is that you're gonna be drawing a lot of useless icebreakers. I just drew a batter and I already have one. Uh, what a waste of time. So there's a lot of ways to go about thinking about Netrunner decks when you get to the more advanced field. But for now, the number one thing that you want is you wanna have all three of these breakers and you wanna have them quickly so that you can start really threatening the corp and not get locked out of a server that's gonna have an agenda behind it. So can you run it down for me? What, going into building your first runner mm -hmm. deck, start it straight back from the top really quick now that we've done it. Let's run it. it. First, <laughs> Run it back. Like we have breakers of each type, barrier, sentry, and code gate, and three of each. Now, if you're feeling crazy, you could import one from Anarch, you could import one from Criminal, you could do it however you wanted. You can have one sentry of, uh, you know, you can have two batting rams and one morning star. You could do it however you wanted, but get yourself three breakers of each type of ice. So you've got your nine breakers there. All right. Then we're looking at money, 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 money. So I got Magnum Opus, Sure Gamble, Modded, Underworld Contact, little Combo Wombo there. And, and I've also got a little Infiltration, which I might hopefully never use for money, but it's there in case I need it. Uh, and so once you've got money and breakers, we have the basics of Netrunner covered. And then we move into the tricks. 
And okay. so now we might import things like inside job, emergency shutdown. Multi-access. Multi-access, those kinds of things. The first, the first trick you should look for is multi-access. So indexing in maker's eye from the shaper card pool makes sense. Well, what am I not threatening at that point? It might be that I import uh, HQ interface and emergency shutdown so that I have benefits for running HQ. It might be that I import bank job or other things that attack remote servers so that I then have options there. If I play the game and I'm figuring out I don't have enough money to trash everything that I want to trash, maybe I import some scrubbers or some other things from other factions, and that'll take care of that. So I, I look at multi-access first and then just general search, you know, card draw, <laughs> those well, kinds of things. At this point, you're looking at what does your faction do? Mm -hmm. What tools do you have available to you? And that's the tricks, right? You're, you're figuring out how you're going to leverage whatever it is you're... you're Faction wants you to do your ID. That's absolutely right. And then uh, I think we've done it. Do we have room for Fem or do we have to cut Fem? She's in. 3, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. We've got no room for Fem. Oh no, Fem's gone. Out. Tossed. Uh, but, the other thing of note I, that we, I want to mention is the, the memory allocation. Yes. So understand how much memory you have, making sure you do have a way, because the longer a game goes on, the f more corpse can get set up and you have to have that rig. That's why it's yeah. so important to have one of each kind. And so if you can't have all of those programs out at the same time, you have a fundamental problem. Yeah, my, and my general flow is choose my ID. So I'm, a, I'm usually kind of more of a theme-based player than like a down the line what's the most effective kind of player. So I'll choose what essentially ID do I want to play? What's the most interesting to me right now? Then I'll look at the consoles available to me and that is all in my own faction, kind of see if there's some themes starting to pair well with my identity, as well as my program suite. So I'm looking at how am I gonna break ice, console brings in the MU and maybe a special ability to hold all of those icebreakers, and then my ID tells me kind of abilities that I might wanna build around. So I look at that, those three things together, and then it goes right down into money and then tricks, multi-access, how do I wanna win this game, what kind of things I wanna bring. Some very successful decks have no multi-access. That's possible. Uh, but all successful decks are going to have a way to get through ice and gain money. So those are your two most important things as a runner. So there is our Shaper deck. We just built that very quickly, right? Two decks ready to go. Two decks ready to go. And the beautiful thing about this game is that you can just keep swapping influence and change out this. And you see your friend uses a, a you know criminal card against you and you say, whoa, that was devastating. So you throw that into your deck. You can... It's just so wide open. Netrunner is really about freedom, and that I think is why it's one of the most successful decks, or successful games. Uh, now, on that note, it is an expandable game. It's a living card game. So this is the revised core set, what we've seen here. Now imagine for a second that there is a giant world out there of cards and identities that you have not even seen yet. That is actually the case. It's reality. Uh, you have additional Netrunner cards that come in two types of products. One is this uh, type of deluxe expansion. And those come out randomly. Um, I think there's like five or six out right now. And probably five, four, four, five. I think there's four. But I think but then there there's might... the campaign box in terminal, terminal directed. Yeah. yeah. And there might be more coming. We we honestly don't know. There's right now one for every faction. They're paired with a faction and a corp. It's like order and chaos, as you might expect, has a lot to do with Anarch. What's the order size? Is that Wayland? Is Wayland supposed to be order? It's Wayland and That's Anarch. a crock, isn't it? <laughs> uh, so that's Wayland and Anarch. So they have these paired deluxe boxes and there might be more coming, we don't know. But then we also have the basic unit, which is the data pack. So these come out about once a month. They introduce 20 new cards for all the various factions. Slow be, drip of new cards to put in your deck. Slow drip of new cards, a living card game. So cards are consistently coming out. So as you might expect, it's actually very beneficial to have as many cards available as you can during this process. Because what if like, a breaker that I might need is in this pack, and I can replace this battering ram with a barrier breaker that's more appropriate for me. Well, data packs is the way to go. Data packs and deluxe expansions. So we're gonna have a uh, deck list for all of these decks posted to our website. We've got the whole series going up in a series of blogs and videos. And then I would hate to not mention that uh, we do run a business. It is called Team <laughs> It's Covenant. true. Uh, we're doing this content, which we love, and we've been doing this for years and years and years, but we also sell these products and a particular note, we have a subscription service for Netrunner that is honestly one of the greatest problem-solving devices that we have uh, put together as a business. We've been doing it since 2012 when Netrunner first came out. And all that it is is you sign up and we will send you all of these things as they come out so that as soon as it releases, it arrives at your door and it's actually a really good price and value and everything else. So sure. um, if that's something that you're interested in, we do have that service available. and. The number of people who have written us that said, 
how nice is it to just get a data pack like just out of nowhere and know that I can now update my deck and be totally caught up for all of my deck building options. Yeah, no, I mean, I've, I've heard a lot of people knowing you're gonna get it and not having to keep up with when something came out, what did I buy, what didn't I buy, just means that you get to spend time playing games instead of hunting down the stuff yeah, to play the games. building the decks, and it's such a, such a fun thing. So thank you guys so very much for watching. Uh, I think I blacked out during this entire video, I have no memory of what was said. That's scary. Uh, but that's how it goes sometimes when you're in front of the camera. <laughs> Thanks for watching. <laughs> Take care, guys. Plenty more to come. <laughs>